Father, as we continue in worship, we turn our attention to Your Word. Lord, we ask that You would speak through Your Word. Our Lord, I pray that You would help me to speak Your truth clearly and boldly. Lord, that each one of us and each one of our hearts would be changed to be more like Christ. That He would be glorified through the change of our hearts by the power of Your Spirit and the hearing of Your Word. And that we would glorify Him not with externals, not with religious rites and legalisms, but with a joyful, loving heart of obedience. And that Your will would be done in our hearts and throughout all of this earth. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. As some of you know, we have been going through the Sermon on the Mount for the past several months now. And we're looking at that portion of Scripture in Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6, our focus will be in verse 10. We're looking at that portion of Scripture most commonly referred to as the Lord's Prayer. But we're calling it the Disciples' Prayer instead of the Lord's Prayer because we see the Lord's Prayer to be John chapter 17. John chapter 17 is a prayer that Jesus can pray, did pray, that we cannot pray. This passage in Matthew chapter 6 is a prayer that Jesus gave to the disciples to pray that he cannot pray because he has no sin that needs any forgiveness. Yet we have sin and we need loads of forgiveness. And so we're calling this the disciples' prayer. And if you recall, what we were looking at was we saw the Beatitudes and then that flowed into Jesus saying, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you're not getting into the kingdom. They're not getting in. You need a different kind of righteousness, not just more of that same legalistic kind of righteousness. And then he went through and said, all of these doctrines that you have heard, you have heard, have been explained to you wrong. This was the intent. This was the intent. This, what it, this is what it looks like. And it's not this outward manifestation. It's an inward heart change. If you look through the Beatitudes, there's not one of us that can do that in our own strength. There is not one individual that can do that apart from the Spirit of God. We need regeneration. We need a new heart to be able to live a life of repentance as kingdom citizens. And as we got into chapter 6, we recognized Jesus shifted slightly from correcting false doctrine to looking at devotion. What is devotion supposed to be like? Is devotion also just something that's supposed to be external? No, devotion is not external. Devotion also, like the intention of the law, was meant to get at the heart. And so he says, beware of practicing your righteousness before men to be noticed by them. If you're doing these things so that others will look at you and go, oh, how holy. I wish I could be like him. I wish I could be like her. It's not devotion. It's acting. You're an actor in the theater. And every time somebody says, wow, you've received your reward. And you have nothing. Nothing coming from God. Because your attentions are not directed toward him, but towards others. And so we entitled this section that we're looking at as an audience of one. An audience of one. We do all things for God. Focusing our audience on Him. When we give, we don't do it so that people will say, wow, look at how nice He is. How nice she is. When we pray, we don't do it like the Pharisees did. The hypocrites. Waiting for when there's the most amount of people going to come and then stepping up and praying. 
by going to a farmer's market in Vancouver and waiting for the height of when everybody's there around 10, 30, 11, and then just stopping in the middle and crying out with a loud voice to pray so that everyone will notice me. No. We are to pray in private to God. That doesn't mean that we can't pray in public. And so Jesus says, this is how you should pray. Remember, not in meaningless repetition, not in empty words, not even just praying the Lord's Prayer. Because that's just empty repetition. Here's a model. Jesus says, I love you. Let me help you to guide through your prayer. And he gives us six petitions. Verse 9, Matthew chapter 6. Jesus says, Pray then in this way, Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed, holy, be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For if you forgive others for their transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, then your Father will not forgive your transgressions. And what we've noticed here is that the prayer is directed at our Father. Remember, there's that corporateness to it. Even when we're praying by ourselves, we recognize that Jesus isn't my quote-unquote personal Lord and Savior. God is not my personal God in the sense of just me and Him. There is a sense which that relationship is true, but Christ saved individuals so that they would be a people for His own possession. We are a corporate gathering of people. That's why there's over 50 one another's in the Scripture. How do you practice one another's when it's just you and God and you live stream something on Sunday and you call it church? You can't. It's our Father. So we need to keep in mind, even when we're by ourselves praying, that we're one of many, one of many who have been called to be God's possession, that we might lift others up too in prayer when we pray. And we also recognize the fatherhood of God, that what Jesus is speaking to here is not the fatherhood of God in the sense of creation, that he created all things, but in the sense of adoption. Those who have been called into special relationship and special communion with God, and we as his children, in that sense, have been brought in by the blood of Christ to have the living God as our Father, our Heavenly Father. And then Jesus gets in. May your name be holy. May your kingdom come. May your will be done. How? On earth, as it is in heaven. You see these first three petitions. Where are they directed? Let's contrast them against the next three. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts, as we have also forgiven our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation. You notice these first three petitions are directed at God. Remember, we're showing the spiritual characteristics of a kingdom citizen, one who is heavenly minded, one who lives a life of repentance, one who calls themselves and proves themselves a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. And what is that first petition? God, our Father, let your name be made holy as it is. Let people see it as it is. You are a holy God. This should be the first desire of our hearts. Notice God's holiness should be desired above our very own life. Was that not true for the Apostle Paul? We even got a little portion of it just from reading that small section in Philippians. Give us this day our daily bread comes when? After hallowed be thy name. And bread we need for life. So before food, before we eat, before we sleep, before we drink, before our health, our happiness, our freedom, our family, our work, we are to be focused on God's holiness. God's holiness should be desired above our salvation. Forgive us our debts. We need forgiveness. But before we think about the forgiveness we need, 
which is important, which is crucial, absolutely necessary for the Christian life. But before that, God, let your name be made holy and even above our protection. Deliver us. But first, if you are to deliver me, Lord, I pray that you would do it in a way that would make your name holy. And then we looked at how did we hallow God's name? When we order our thoughts and our affections and our wills and our goals and our desires and our emotions and our lives so that God would be glorified in and through us, that we would be conduits for the holiness of God, spreading His glory out into our families, out into Vancouver, out into the greater Vancouver and Portland area, and out into the world, that He would be glorified in and through us. We looked at your kingdom come, the second petition. And again, this is a heartfelt plea. This isn't, let your kingdom come. Lord, let your kingdom come. Because that is when the culmination of your holiness and your glory will be made known. And we recognize this isn't Christ's kingdom. This isn't his mediatorial thousand year reign on earth. But this is what, 1 Corinthians 15, 20 and following? After Christ has conquered and subjected everything on this earth as Adam was supposed to do but failed to do, after that, what does Christ do? He gives everything back to the Father. And that's when we have the great white throne judgment. All sinners cast into the lake of fire. And he makes all things new. All things new. No more liars. No more thieves. No more murderers. No more idolaters. No more adulterers. None. No more sin. No more sun. Because God is the light. And his light that's so pure it would wipe us out because we have sin in our mind. And there will be no need for sun because we will have no sin and God will be the light. That leads us here. Your will be done. The third petition, verse 10, on earth as it is in heaven. Keep in mind, what were we looking at also? This isn't just something that we sit down and pray and then get up and go play video games or go do whatever we're going to do. This is a prayer that is to lead to personal obedience. Isn't that one of the reasons why we pray when we pray in these ways? You've heard, you've heard of, uh, of the guy that was sitting there reading through Isaiah and it says, who shall we send for us or who will go? And Isaiah said, here am I. Lord, send me. And so this guy walks up to another brother and said, I was in my devotions this morning and I was reading through Isaiah and he said, here am I, Lord send me and the Lord just put you on my heart. So I think you need to go. No. We're supposed to pray with this focus also on ourselves and how we can implement these truths. If we're praying that God's name would be made holy, where's the most applicable place that it should start? In our lives in our lives. If we're praying that his kingdom would come, what's the most applicable place that it should start? With us in the proclamation of the gospel. Because there is a fixed number of individuals who will be brought into that kingdom and we don't know who they are and so we preach the gospel indiscriminately. And at that right time, at that right time, we will shift into a new age. The same is here. Your will be done. We're not just praying that His will would be done in other people's lives, but also in our lives. And therefore, we need to put our feet with those prayers and step out in obedience. I want us to notice first here, though, who is the petition directed to? Again, it's to our Father. It's directed to the Father. We're asking your will. Father, your will be done. Second, notice that there's two parts here. There's two parts. If you're taking notes, this would be the request and the nature of the request. The request and the nature of the request, or the matter and the manner. The matter and the manner. Let's look at this first part. It says, let your will be done. Literally, just as in heaven, even upon the earth. But before we get into this, 
request, let your will be done. And the way, the nature of the request, just as is in heaven, even upon the earth. What is will? What is will? Your will be done. What are we asking for here? It's important to know what we're asking for. If we're going to ask for something. This is actually an exceedingly complex doctrine. And it's only understood through Scripture. And so, keep your Bibles handy, keep your writing hands ready to go, because we're going to be traveling through a lot of Scripture so that we can begin to understand. Though we won't be able to comprehend, we will be able, I pray, by the power of God's Spirit and by His grace, to begin to understand this. First, we need to know Everything, without exception, is dependent upon the sovereign will of the God of the Bible. Everything, without exception. The dust that falls. Everything. You stub your toe. Everything. Let's look at it in several categories. The whole of creation. Both the initial creative act from nothing, which we can't comprehend. We've never experienced nothing. Everything without exception. The whole of creation, both in the initial creative act and the sustaining of all things, is by the sovereign will of God. I have a witness. Revelation 4.11 Worthy are you, our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and because of your will... They existed and were created. The free, yet seemingly arbitrary, choice of God to save some unworthy sinners while passing over others is by the sovereign will of God. Romans 9, 15 and 16. God said to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then it does not depend on the man who wills or the man who runs, but on God who has mercy. The establishment and destruction of governments is by the sovereign will of God. The establishment and destruction of governments is by the sovereign will of God. Romans 13.1 Every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God. And those which exist are what? Established by God. The suffering and death of Christ was by the sovereign will of God. Sometimes that's a difficult one. The suffering and death of Christ was by the sovereign will of God. Acts 2.23, this man delivered over by the predetermined plan. Did you catch that? Predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God. You nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. Who killed Jesus? God? God? The Jews or the Romans? The godless men. Yes. Each for different reasons. The regeneration of believers is by the sovereign will of God. James 1.18 And the exercise of His will He brought us forth by the word of truth so that we would be a kind of first fruits among His creatures. The sanctification of believers is by the sovereign will of God. Philippians 2, 12 and 13, picking up where we left off in our pastoral prayer. Then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. The suffering of believers. Have you ever experienced suffering? Have you experienced trials? Did you know that that was sovereignly ordained by the will of God? First Peter 17, It is better if God should will it so that you suffer for doing what is right rather than for doing what is wrong. If God should will it so. The smallest, seemingly insignificant things are dependent upon the sovereign will of God. Are not two sparrows sold for a cent? And yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your Father. But the very hairs on your head 
are all numbered. Think about that. The hairs of your head. I don't know how many hairs I have on my head. It changes from day to day. I know it's decreasing. But I don't know at what rate. But God knows. And he's always known. And a bird falls and dies. And he knows. Apart from him, apart from your father, what's implied there? Apart from his will. Also, the sovereign will of God is just that. It's sovereign. It's independent. It's autonomous. It's not based or dependent in any way upon anyone or anything or any outside influence or any counsel or anything. God acts according to his own good pleasure. Psalm 115.3 Our God is in the heavens. What? He does whatever he pleases. God is a supreme being who is not answerable to anyone. Daniel 4.35 All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing, but he does according to his will in the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And no one can ward off his hand or say to him, What have you done? God is the potter. We are the clay. Romans 9, 19 to 21. You will say to me then, why does he still find fault? How can God find fault? For who can resist his will? On the contrary, who are you, O man, who answers back to God? The thing molded will not say to the molder, why did you make me like this, will it? Or does not the potter have the right over the clay to make from the same lump one vessel for honorable use, and another for common use. This goes against every fiber of our being. But have you ever seen a clay pot or a lump of clay lash out at the person playing with the clay? Have your kids ever played with Play-Doh? Have you ever been worried that the Play-Doh might say something inappropriate or rude to your child? No. And we have no problem with that. But as soon as we are brought into it, now we have a problem. So why end the pray, your will be done, if it's already being done? Why would this command be here if God's will is already being done and none of us can resist his will? It's a good question and I'm glad you asked because that's where we're going next. There's two aspects to God's will. His secret will, the will of his decree, and his revealed will, the will of his command. His secret will, the will of his decree, and his revealed will, the will of his command. Deuteronomy 29, 29. The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things revealed to us and our sons forever. Is that where it ends? Or is there more to that verse? that we may observe all the words of the law. So there's the secret things of the Lord which we cannot know. There's the revealed things in the word that we can and must know, and more than that, that we must obey, that we must do. Here we see a clear glimpse of the two aspects, God's secret and revealed will in one verse. Turn with me, if you would, really quickly to Ephesians 1.11. I think it's helpful if, if we can see this. Rather than just listening to me, if you can see this in your own Bible, I think this will be helpful. As we look just briefly at God's secret will, what we cannot know. There's things about it we can know, but we don't know what his sovereign decree is. We don't, we don't even know the weather. I don't know about you. You could check your weather app every couple hours up here, and it's different even for the day, let alone the rest of the week. Oh, look, it's going to snow. No, it's not. It's raining. Oh, look, there's going to be a thunderstorm. No, uh it's sunny. We don't even know these things with all the knowledge we have. Ephesians 1.11 In Christ... Also, we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose, to his purpose, who works all things after the counsel of his will. No doubt, we have read this many times, many times. 
Let's stop for a moment and let's look at what's being said here with regard to God's will. Notice again, that is a, a single will. A single will. It is His will. That is singular. His will. Notice also again that it is a sovereign, it is an independent will. Not based or dependent upon any way, in any fashion, in any degree, on any outside influence or counsel. Because it is the counsel, singular, of His singular will. Singular. Notice also that it is exhaustive. It is comprehensive. It includes everything. It literally says, all things. What are all things? Here are a few. Prepare your hearts. This first one, you might not have a problem with, but some of the others. Ordaining the good actions of people. Ordaining the good actions of people. Ephesians 2.10 Good works which God prepared beforehand that what? That we should walk in them. The good works that we do, we don't have to figure out what kind of good works am I supposed to do now that I'm a Christian. God prepared them beforehand that you should walk in them. Ordaining sinful acts. Ordaining sinful acts. Now God is not sinning, but He is ordaining sinful acts. Did we read Acts 2.23? The murder of Jesus? The wages of sin is death. He never sinned. He was innocent. Is it wrong to kill an innocent person? The most morally pure person ever to walk the earth, the only person who's ever been free from sin? Isn't that the greatest crime in the whole of creation? That the spotless lamb was killed? Who did it? God? The Jews or the Romans? And you said what? Yes. God ordains even sinful acts. Proverbs 16.4 even. He has made the wicked for the day of disaster. Event, events that appear contingent from man's perspective. Genesis 50.20. Joseph with his brothers. You say, you meant this for evil, but God used it for good. You probably hear that a lot. I hear that a lot with preachers. That's not what it says, is it? What does it say? You meant this for evil. God meant, same word, this for good. Literally, it means to weave. You were weaving this for evil, but God was weaving this for good. And that is the key to understanding the one that we looked at before, ordaining sinful acts. Proverbs 16.33 talks about the lot is cast into the lap, but it's every decision is from the Lord. Every roll of the dice, sovereignly ordained by God. And we see that, don't we? Look at uh, Achan and his sin. When they came into Jericho, Achan stole, and they lost the battle at Ai. And what happened? They cast lots to see who it was, and the lot fell upon Achan, and he was the one that stole. What about the choosing of Saul to be king? How was he chosen to be king? Well, ahead of time, Samuel knew. But when the people chose, how did the people choose the king? They cast lots, and the lot fell upon Saul, the one that God told Samuel this is going to be the king. So it seems contingent, insignificant, a roll of the dice. But God's will is exhaustive. The means as well as the ends of the acts, Psalm 119, 89 to 91, Ephesians 1, 4, the length of a person's life, all our days are numbered, the geography of a person's life, Acts 17, 26, he has appointed the boundaries of their habitation. So as we look at that, be honest with yourselves. Do you think that that's unfair? Do you think that that's unfair? If you do, 
You know why? You know why you think that's unfair? Sin. Sin. Not just any sin, but a most great sin. You desire to be God and to reign on His throne. You forget your place as the clay and desire yourself to be the potter. There can only be one sovereign. And maybe even in some small portion, you desire it to be you. Horatius Boner puts it this way, Much zeal is shown for the freedom of man's will. Little jealousy seems to be left for the freedom of God's will. Men insist that it is unjust and tyrannical in God to control their wills, yet see nothing unjust, nothing proud, nothing satanic in attempting to fetter and direct the will of God. Man, it seems, cannot have his own foolish will gratified unless the all-wise God will consent to relinquish his. You see what he's saying there? It's not fair that God can do all that. I want to relinquish God's will because it imposes upon my own. That's a battle. Take care where you stand. Well, we looked at God's secret will in part. Let's look at God's revealed revealed will. These are things we can and must know. God's revealed will we can and must know the things God has commanded for all people everywhere. Here are a few. Only those who repent will escape the coming judgment. Acts 17, 30 and 31. Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God is declaring to all men everywhere that they should repent because he has fixed the day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed, having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead. Who do you think that is? Christ. All men everywhere are commanded. Only those who in Christ will experience eternal life. Now remember, we've talked in Bible study, eternal life isn't so much quantity of time, but quality of life. Everyone is created to be eternal. Everyone is created to be eternal. Either to go into the new heavens and the new earth, as we spoke about last week, or to be cast into hell. The quality of eternal life is based upon who is there and who that fellowship is with. Heaven is intermediary, but heaven would not be heaven if Christ would not be there. And there wouldn't be joy in the eternal state if Christ were not there. It is a quality of life. John 6, 40, For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who beholds the Son and believes in Him will have eternal life, and I myself will raise Him up on the last day. Isn't that comforting? Christ says, I myself will do this. Only those who do God's will are able to enter his kingdom. Matthew 7, 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. That's terrifying. People are calling him Lord. There's a profession of faith. Only those who do God's will are a part of the family of Jesus Christ. Matthew 12, 50. For whoever does the will of my Father who is in heaven, he is my brother and sister and mother. You want to be part of the family of Christ? Pursue him. Repent. Believe. And obey. You want to be blessed, supernaturally, joyous, and happy? Jesus said in Luke eleven twenty eight, 28, Blessed are those who hear the word of God and observe it. Now remember, this isn't just a legalistic kind of working out. This is fueled from a heart of devotion and a heart of obedience. God's secret will is always in effect and can neither be controlled, mitigated, hindered in any way by anyone. 
and we're not held accountable for God's secret will. We're not held accountable for God's secret will. That's not something that when we face the Lord, He's going to judge us. Hey, you didn't know this. But I'm going to judge you for it. He doesn't do that. God's revealed will is settled in heaven forever and cannot be broken. But in God's wisdom and sovereignty, it can be resisted in this age. This is what Jesus has in view here in our passage as he teaches his disciples, and by extension us, to pray. So the first aspect, the request, that the revealed will of God would be done. Your will be done. Lord, these things that you have revealed to us, that they would be done. And how is this petition, this request described? Let's look at the nature of the request. He says literally, just as in heaven, even upon the earth. So the way your revealed will is done in heaven? Pray that that would be done just as it is in heaven in the same way that it would be done on earth. How is it done in heaven? Well, I think it would be helpful for us to understand this by looking to heaven. Consider the angels as our example. What are angels that are in heaven? They are servants of the Most High God. Where are these angels? They are in heaven. Just like our verse. How is God's will done by the angels? Here is a few. Here is a few ways in which God's, God's will is done. Angels serve God constantly. Constantly. Day and night, there are angels around the throne of God saying what? Holy, holy, holy. Worshiping Him. Praising Him. Angels serve God Completely, constantly, completely. Psalm 103, 20 and 21. Bless the Lord, you his angels, mighty in strength, who perform his word, obeying the voice of his word, the Lord, all you, his hosts, who serve him, doing his will. He boxed in. The psalmist boxed in there. You're doing this completely. Angels obey instantly. You remember Daniel's famous prayer? You know that verse, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and I will turn and heal their land. And and every day, National Day in Prayer, everybody goes, oh, yay, oh, yeah, let's pray and heal America. There's an application, but that's not what that text means. And that prayer was answered. Daniel prayed that prayer. And it was answered in Daniel chapter 9. Now, while I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel and presenting my supplication before Yahweh, my God, in behalf of the holy mountain of my God, while I was still speaking in prayer, then the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision previously, came to me in my extreme weariness about the time of the evening offering and gave me instruction and talked with me and said, O Daniel, I have now come forth to give you insight with understanding. At the beginning of your supplications, the command was issued. What command? Go to Daniel. And I've come to tell you, for you are highly esteemed. Instantly. While Daniel was still praying. Now, I don't know how fast angels travel. But while he was still praying, at the beginning of that prayer, God already knew he was going to pray. He said, hey, hey, go get, go to Daniel. And he went. Angels serve God willingly. Gabriel was also sent where? To Zechariah? To tell him about the birth of his son, John? And where else? Mary? Luke one twenty six. Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city in Galilee called Nazareth. Did he, did he go? Did he go to Nazareth? Did he talk with Mary? Yes, he did. Have you been sent by God? Do you go? It's easy for us to sit back and look at the angels and go, wow, yeah, the angels do this and they do that and to make charts and everything about it. But let's bring this down to our level. What about you, Christian? As we're reading through, looking at how the angels obey the will of God, does your heart resonate with a hearty amen? Me too. There's more need to pray 
your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Angels worship Christ. Hebrews 1, 6. When he again brings the firstborn into the world, he says, and let all the angels of God worship him. Keep this in mind too, as we're examining our own hearts. Angels do not grumble about doing the will of God. Angels do not complain about doing the will of God. Angels are not slow to obey. Angels do not first consider their comfort before planning some kind of course of obedience that would mitigate any suffering or any trials. Angels are not indifferent. They don't say, well, since you're sovereign, God, it doesn't matter what I do, because you're sovereign. Sometimes we do that, though, don't we? Oh, God's sovereign. And rather than using that as something to warm our hearts, and to fill our hearts, and to give us strength to obey, we use it as an opportunity to grow slack, sluggish, and lazy. So how does this translate to us? If we're to do the will of God, we must first know it. We must first know what to do. Jeremiah says, Let not a wise man boast of his wisdom, and let not the mighty man boast of his might. Let not a rich man boast of his riches, but let him who boasts boast in this. What? That he understands and knows me. That I am the Lord who exercises loving kindness, justice, righteousness on the earth. For I delight in these things, says the Lord. But knowing God's will is not enough, is it? Judas knew God's will. Ask him how it's helping him now. Satan knows God's will. Is he better off for it? It must be loved. It must be treasured. This isn't just some academic exercise. If God's will is known, it must be treasured. Your word I have treasured in my heart that I might not sin against you. It is my prize. It is my possession that I love, my joy, my delight. If it's known and treasured, it will be performed. Colossians 3, 16 and 17, let the word of Christ richly dwell, richly dwell within you with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another with psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all things in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. Do you see this connection that scripture places between doing the will of God and knowing, having an intimate relationship with the person of Jesus Christ. They're not separate. If they are separate, you have a problem. Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weary, and what? All you who are weary, heavy laden, you'll find rest. Take my yoke upon you, for my burden is easy. My yoke is light. He says, I am gentle and humble for your souls. Your souls. Without this yoke, without this learning from me, for I am gentle, there is no rest for your souls. It is only in the learning from Christ and the taking on of the yoke that the rest for the soul will be found. Knowledge without delightful obedience. Get this. Knowledge without delightful obedience is nothing more than a torch to light your way to hell. You may know many things and only be worse off for it because to whom much is given, much is required. If the desire of your soul is not to make this prayer, your will be done. The manner in which you delight to live your life, you're not a Christian. 
If the desire of your soul is not to make this prayer, your will be done. The manner in which you delight to live your life. There is a serious problem there. There is a need for repentance. If we desire to have God's will done on earth as it is in heaven, then not only will we pray toward that end, but when we do God's will, we'll do it as an act of worship. We'll do it constantly, completely, instantly, willingly. Why? Because that's how the angels in heaven do it, and that's what this prayer is saying. Just like it's done in heaven, let it be done on the earth in the same way. And Lord, let it start with me. Without grumbling, without complaining, without slackness, desires for personal comfort, without any kind of indifference, will hunger and will thirst for all of that righteousness. As Christ is our treasure and His words our very life. Turn to John 6, 38. Consider Jesus with me. John 6, 38. What does he say? For I have come down from heaven where the will of God is done, which is the model by which we should be praying for the will of God to be done here on the earth, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of him who sent me. All he has given me, I lose nothing, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who beholds the Son and believes in Him will have eternal life, and I myself will raise Him up on the last day. He didn't come to do His own will. And He didn't need anything. He had intrinsic glory that He veiled by taking on flesh. We have empty glory, which is nothing. It's just the thought of glory that we think that we have, that we've ascribed to ourselves. But we won't humble ourselves and we won't seek to do His will. It can't be like this. And this isn't a Sunday, Wednesday, Tuesday thing. This is a waking till sleeping. This is a lifestyle. Not a hobby. In John 4.34, Jesus said, My food, my food is to do the will of Him who sent me and to accomplish His work. How many of you have trouble not snacking? How many of you have trouble not snacking? We should have the same trouble not doing the will of God. It should be so natural to us. We go, oh, I want something salty. I want some chips. I want something sweet. I have an Oreo. Some chocolate. Our thoughts should be, how can I lift up and glorify Christ? How can His will be done? With my heart with my mind, with my hands, in this situation, right now. John 7, Jesus answered and said, My teaching is not mine, but His who sent me. If anyone is willing to do His will, he will know of the teaching, whether it is of God or whether I speak for myself. He who speaks from his self seeks his own glory, but he who is seeking the glory of the one who sent him, he is true and there is no unrighteousness in him. This brings up a very important point. What is this revealed teaching? What are these things we have to know? Well, obviously, the general answer is what? The whole counsel of God. But what's the command in Matthew 28? Going, therefore. Why are we going? All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Going, therefore, make disciples. That's the command. Make disciples. How do we make disciples? Baptizing them? Teaching? Teaching them what? All I have commanded you. That sounds important. That sounds revealed. It sounds like the will of somebody that has revealed it. 
commanded it. Do we know the commands of Christ? It's only a couple hundred. Maybe four hundred. Do we know them? Should we know them? If we're to be disciple makers, teaching them. Here's a few examples from the lips of Jesus. Now, Lord willing, we'll get into some more next week. You must be born again. You must be born again. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. John 3.3 3. You must repent. Unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Luke 3.13 The detestable irony of that word. Isn't there a detestable irony found in that word? How so many people on earth loathe to hear that word repent and they hate it. Indeed, it soon will be hate speech. But how many poor souls are in hell that wish they could hear it just one more time? Lord, if I could just hear one more time, I promise I will repent. Isn't that A sad irony. You must come to Christ. If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. John 7, 37. You must believe in Christ. Do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. John 14, 1. You must love Christ. And you must love Christ above all. What's all? Everything. Without exception. What about my Bible reading? You must love Christ more than your Bible reading. More than your quiet time. What do you mean? We talked about this on Friday. You search the Scriptures and you think that they have eternal life. But it's them that testify about me. I've met so many people that sin through their quiet time And they make it an idol. What will you do when you're arrested and you don't get a Bible? What will you do then? He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. These are all off the lips of Jesus. Matthew 10, 37. Now I want to caution you. Be prepared to pray, your will be done. Because we know what's coming. We've seen the end of the story. We have uh, Genesis to Revelation. This is not, bless me with this earthly comfort, possessions, and a life of relaxation in Florida where I can collect seashells. This is a life of suffering. This is a life of pain. This is a life of persecution. A life of sorrow. Indeed, Christ was a man of sorrows. Yeah. I'm not saying to avoid praying this way. It is a command. It's a command from Christ. I am saying, take heed. Don't pray flippantly. Don't pray loosely. Don't pray casually. Don't pray vainly. Do you recall this prayer on the lips of our Lord? Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. It cost Jesus his life. He did this in love. He didn't do this in legalism. It was for the joy set before Him that He endured the cross and despised its shame. And He requires nothing less from us. The only thing that's different is we have His strength, His victory to look forward to, and we don't have to pay for our own sins in Christ. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. But the earthly struggles we are to expect In fact, we're to use them as a gauge by which to measure our Christian walk. Examine yourself. 
Deny yourself. Take up your cross. Follow Christ. Whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. Examine yourself, your thoughts, your desires, your affections. How do they sound? Think about when you go through situations day to day, when a struggle or a trial comes your way. Do you do you think in your heart like Adam? Think. Think back to a situation. Do you think in your heart like Adam and say, not your will, but mine? Or do you think like Christ, not my will, but yours? It's a sobering examination, isn't it? In Adam, all die. In Christ, all will be made alive. This is a good indicator to see, am I in Adam or am I in Christ? Whose example do you follow in your heart? Now, we're not looking at perfection here. If there is a struggle, a battle, a war being waged within your members because you recognize, I'm so much like Adam, and I hate it, and I'm constantly trying to put to death these deeds of the flesh that I might be more like Christ because I love Him and I desire Him and I treasure His Word and I don't want to sin against Him. That's a good sign that you're alive. But if there is no fight, and you look like Adam, you're dead. Even while you walk. Let us continue the battle, putting to death the deeds of the flesh. Because in the proper time, these prayers will be answered. I know now it seems like this struggle, this trial, this life is never ending. But it's not. What does Paul call it? Momentary, light, affliction. And what is it doing? Producing for you an eternal weight. Rather than going down to the Columbia River. Give me this puddle of rotten water here and I'll be happy. Because you will be hungering and thirsting for all righteousness. Not that we obtain it all, but that's what we hunger for because that's the desire of our heart. To be like Christ, the righteous one. The one who is beloved of God who purchases our salvation on our behalf. Remember, we cannot earn our salvation with these. Christ has done that. It's by grace alone, faith alone, Christ alone. But that should produce something, shouldn't it? If you have a tree, you expect it to produce something. And it should produce obedience and a desire for us to say, not my will but yours be done. How many times have we gone through a trial and said, Lord, take this trial away. Period. New paragraph. When instead what we should have said, Lord, if it's your will, take this trial away. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. May I glorify you in the midst of this suffering. Strengthen me toward that end, I pray. We all suffer. We know suffering's coming. If you're not in a trial right now, you soon will be. James says, Consider it all joy, my brothers, when you slowly ease into a trial, seeing it off from afar, as you're standing on an escalator that's really long, that's almost broken, going really slow, and you're like, "Uh uh-oh, trial's coming. Got about 15 minutes I can prepare myself. Let me go do some research really quick, get my three by five index cards with my scripture verses, and then read through those and then pray. No, when you fall into 
You ever tripped and fallen? You don't plan to do it. It's unexpected. But we know they're coming. Because what does it say? When. When you. Not if you. So let us prepare our hearts and our minds so that we might glorify God even in the midst of that suffering, especially in the midst of that suffering. Especially should God bring persecution. In the proper time, these prayers will be answered and God's name will be regarded as holy among all his creatures. His kingdom will come. It will last forever. And then his commanded will will be done, just like his secret will is, perfectly by those who have loved him. Above all else, as we glory in his love for all eternity. So, let us, Master's Bible Church, pursue Christ in love with a joyful heart set on serving the one whom our soul desires. Amen? Amen. Father, your will, we ask that it would be done, Lord, that you would make your will known to us that you would illumine our hearts and our minds as we study your word, as we seek to teach your word to others, as we seek to apply it to our lives, Lord, that we would be diligent in living a holy life, sacrificing ourselves in a way that's acceptable to you, Lord, that we would worship you in all things, and not being conformed to this world, but being conformed to Christ, that we would have a renewing of our mind that would be the work of your word and your spirit mightily working within us, that we would prove what your will is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect to your glory. Lord, strengthen us that we might take up our cross, die daily, and live for Christ so that on that day our joy may be made full when we see him face to face. It's in his name we pray. Amen.